All right. Well, then let's go in or let's get going. So thanks again for everybody that's joined. Uh, this webinar, we're going to be going over the accelerated procedure for the determination of lipid oxidation stability. And specifically, we'll be looking at our VELP oxy test. So to start off with, I wanted to do a brief introduction and go over our agenda for the day. Um, we're going to go over first the introduction for uh, VELP Scientifica and VELP Scientific overall. We're then going to talk about our VELP oxy test reactor and some of the technical features of that. We're going to go over our applications in food research. We're going to look at some studies on packaging materials with uh, Dr. Antonella Cavazza. We'll then look at our oxy test reliability and some of the advantages of the instrument. And then finally, we'll have a live demo from our headquarters at VELP Scientifica. So again, uh, my name is Corey Letizio. I am the uh, VELP Regional Sales Manager. Um, another speaker that I'll be talking today will be Dr. Antonella Cavazza. She's the lead researcher of analytical chemistry at the University of Parma over in Italy. And then I'll also have my colleague, Matteo Bassani. Um, he's part of the VELP analytical department and he'll be doing our live demo. So to start off with, with a little background for VELP Scientifica, uh, we were established in 1983 and we've been privately owned by the same family since inception. We have over 70 employees and we've seen consistent growth since our inception. Our headquarters in manufacturing are located in Italy and specifically about 30 kilometers north of the Milan area. Now, VELP Scientific Inc. is the subsidiary that I'm a part of. Uh, our headquarters are in Long Island, New York, and we provide sales, service, and analytical support to our North American market. Now, VELP China was established in 2019, and they provide sales and service support to the greater China market. Now, in addition to this, we have an established network of more than 300 partners in over 100 countries worldwide. So I'd like to quickly go over our product portfolio. We have two different branches, our first being our analytical instruments branch. And now this is the branch we'll be focusing on today. We do have protein analyzers such as Keldol and elemental analyzers. We have fat extractors. We have raw and dietary fiber analyzers. But today, like I mentioned, we'll be focusing specifically on our oxidation stability reactor, and that is our oxy test. Now, on the laboratory equipment side of things, we have our magnetic stirs and hot plates. We have overhead stirs, homogenizers, and a wide variety to support laboratory needs. So I'd like to touch base briefly regarding our local service and application support. Now, first, I'd like to talk about our help desk and remote support. This is the best way to get a hold of us if something is to happen with your instrument, and we're available around the clock to support you with your analytical needs. This gets into a little bit of our application support. We're able to optimize um, applications for our products, such as our oxid oxidation stability reactor. From here, we go into more of our on-site services, including some technical assistance, installation and training, and preventative maintenance, where you'd have a VELP service manager be able to come on site to support you whenever you need. And finally, we do also offer calibration certification services, so you're able to ensure your instrument is running optimally. So let's talk about oxidation stability. And specifically, let's start with what oxidation stability is. So the oxidative stability of fats can be defined <clears throat> excuse me, as a resistance to oxidation over the processing and storage period. And one of the most important reactions is associated with the lipid portion of that stability. Now, the chemical reactions often occur between oxygen and some of those bigger components of food and are one of the most important causes of food alteration and quality determination. So the oxidative state is an important indicator of the performance and shelf life of foods. Now, there are a few different uh, factors influencing the shelf life. Uh, first is our microbiological, which is kind of, um, as it mentions, microbial spoilage is observed in a sample. The next would be our organoleptic, and that is uh, our shelf life studies will end when a product is either disliked or unacceptable. And finally, the physical and chemical side of things, and that is where fat and oil oxidation, and that's what we'll be focusing on mostly today. So some of the effects of lipid auto-oxidation, um, they're gonna include mostly the loss of sensor, sensorial quality of foods. Um, that can include unpleasant flavor and bad smells, 
um, rancidity, things such as that. And this can also cause damage from an economic point of view, as you well know. And this could also be a risk for health of consumers. So one thing I always like to mention is the OXY test and the AOS, AOCS International Standard Procedure. So CD12C-16 is the determination for of the oxidation stability of foods, oils, and fats using the OXY test oxidation test reactor. Now, this is important, and I always like to mention that the OXY test is the only officially approved method and instrument for this method. Um, in addition to this, it has also been validated by Eurochem guidelines using a model system for uh, people over in Europe. So let's talk a little bit about our OXY test and some of the standard working conditions. So the sample is placed inside two chambers, as you can see in the picture there, and is subject to two things. Established overpressure of pure oxygen, um, oftentimes that's around six bar, and a high constant temperature, sometimes around 90 degrees Celsius. Now, the thing with that is we can do up to 120 degrees Celsius and six bar, but this is the sample, I guess, conditions that are suitable for most food samples. And so here, we're gonna talk a little bit about our induction period. So what is the induction period? This is the time required to reach a detectable oxidation level. So as you can see here on the graph, we have pressure and time on our y-axis and, um, and a time on our x-axis. And from here, we're able to see as time goes on and where that inflection oxidation curve occurs is going to be our induction period. And as you can see, the example here is olive oil, and it took around eight and a half hours. <clears throat> and with this, I also like to mention our OxyTest software. So this is enabled through a PC. It's quick and easy to use. And in one screen, you're going to be able to have all your program parameters, run your conditions and run your results, and then get your results and be able to export them as you see fit. Now, the nice thing with this software is you can connect up to four OxyTest units, and it can be connected to the same PC, and they can remain completely independent of each other to increase productivity and flexibility. So that'd be a total of eight samples total. So I won't go into the applications into too much depth, depth because I know that uh, Dr. Antonella will be going into those further, but there are many different options you can use for our oxy test. So the first is a repeat, repeat, repeatability test, which is, as it sounds, just ensuring um, the instrument is operating correctly. You can have freshness tests for overall incoming ingredients testing. And then formula and packaging comparisons are great for R&D professionals, so we're able to look at different products in different states. The induction period during aging, and then finally our estimated shelf life test, and that is what a lot of our customers use the instrument for primarily. So some of the industries that our oxy test can be in, as we've talked a lot about food, feed, and beverage, you look at things like bread, um, vegetable oils, chocolates, animal feed. But in addition to this, this instrument can also be applicable to our cosmetic, chemical, petrochemical, and pharmaceutical um, applications. Examples of this, like it mentions, are creams, lip balm, um, biodiesel, and then other fat-coated drugs. So finally, why the oxy test? And to start off with the con quality control side, it's nice to have that control of raw materials and ingredients as they're coming in. Also looking at transportation and the effects that those ingredients can have. And finally, storage periods for those samples. Now on the R&D side, as I talked about previously, our product development and behavior along with formula optimization are super beneficial to have process optimization, and also alternative packaging solutions that you're able to test with this instrument. And finally, for our cloud connectivity. So the OxyTest can be connected to our proprietary developed Hermes cloud platform. And some of the benefits that you can see from connecting the instrument to this would be real-time monitoring and notifications, um, accessing your data from anytime and really anywhere with a smart device, um, enhanced service and application support is probably going to be the best area that you're able to use that. And you can get immediate software updates and create and share reports, track trends, and get useful insights. So next, I'm going to pass it to, again, I'm Dr. Antonella Cavaza, and we should be good from there. 
Good morning to everybody. And thank you, first of all, to Velp Scientifica for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about the research that I'm doing in Parma with OxyTest. You see the slide? Okay. So, so I, I came from the University of Parma. You can see here on the screen some of the picture of our campus. Uh, this university is located in the north of Italy and is in, a, in an area that is called the Italian Food Valley because it's a, a, a district very rich of industry producing food and also producing um, packaging materials for packaging. So that's why I, I work as an analytical chemist, but with my research group, we have been always working about food quality and the packaging quality and safety assessment of food and packaging. So most of the applications that I will show you are about food and packaging. Um, I, I started working with OxyTest in almost 10 years ago, and uh, I also took part to the validation process that um, took place around 2015 uh, with AOCS, so in collaborating with Velp uh, Scientifica. And uh, in, in this presentation, I will go on different examples. So I will start with some application related to food research, so to food to food products, and then I will move to uh, present some results about packaging materials. And then I will um, uh, have a look at uh, sustainability, because it's something very important lately to, to look at uh, the zero waste goal. Um, in the end, uh, we will focus on the reliability of OxyTest, uh, comparing to the traditional techniques. Uh, so to show um, in, a, in a brief summary, uh, which are the strength points of these techniques. So let's start with some example of application. So th this is the, the first work that we have done uh, about um, olive oils. Um, we all know that uh, um, olive oil is, um, is a product that uh, during its storage um, goes to a decrease, a progressive decrease of its um, um, quality and nutritional values because of oxidative and agrolytic degradation of its uh, bioactive compounds. We also know that in nature, there are many aromatic plants and vegetables that contain active compounds that can be useful to protect the um, oxidation of oil. So we try to add, uh, as is um, normally done uh, traditionally so from many, many years now, th th this habit to add uh, rosemary or oregan or spice to oil to keep it um, with a good quality in, um, for a long time. So we try to check using OxyTest the increasing of stability of the oil, measuring the induction period. In, in this graph, you see the difference between the IP, the induction period, uh, which is um, the, the, this red line that is related to a blank sample of oil, olive oil, and then the difference um, between it and the um, same sample enriched uh, with 3% of rosemary essential oil. So as you can see, there is an, a gain in the oxidation stability. And uh, similarly, we, we proceeded adding also Oregon essential oils and comparing the two extract, rosemary and Oregon, we could see that both of them gave an advantage over blank olive oil and Oregon was much more active. A, a similar approach was uh, followed uh, with uh, pepper powder. Uh, you, you also probably know that uh, peppers is, is rich of antioxidant and it's, uh, um, it's used also to enrich olive oil. Uh, then what we wanted to explore was if the hotness of the pepper was correlated to this 
um, possibility to stabilize the oil. So we tried an experiment um, with three different peppers, a sweet pepper, a medium um, hot pepper, and a very hot pepper, so with a difference in, um, in um, hotness. And um, we saw that at time zero, so just after the addition of pepper powder to the oil, there was a, a gain in um, uh, oxidative instability for all the three sample with all the spice respect to the blank oil. So all of them were active. Then we tried to repeat the experiment after three months of storage. And then we saw a, a small difference. So all of them were um, more stable than the blank oil. So all of them were working. But between the three of them, the sweet one was the more active. So it means that the, um, the effect on the oxidative stability is not uh, exerted by the capsaicin oils, so the molecule responsible for the piquancy of the pepper but it's probably due to the presence of other compounds such as carotenoids or um, ascorbic acid, uh, uh, many other um, compounds occurring in the, um, in the pepper. Uh, we also confirmed this because we performed experiments uh, on the FRAP value of the three peppers, and we saw that there was a very good correlation between the induction period and the FRAP value. And this study, uh, has been then published in, um, uh, in when you see here uh, the, the article. Now changing the, the, the topic, this is another research that we performed with um, um, with the industry that is uh, that was interested in um, um, tuna fish uh, fillets stored under oil. So they produce tuna fish and they uh, believed that the quality of the tuna fillets are improving with time during the storage. So they usually uh, sell their product after one or two years of storage in oil because it seems that the, the um, tissue of the fillet becomes softer and with a good, a better taste. So we wanted to explore what, what happens during the storage. And we divided, the, we separated the tuna fillets from the oil. And we followed the behavior of tuna and of oil at different expiring date of the, of the tins. We could see that there was an increase of the apparent quality measured as oxidative stability of the tuna during aging. So as, as time passes, the oxidative stability of the tuna was increasing. And th th this was very surprising for us because usually with time, you, you see a degradation of a, of a food. On the contrary, uh, studying, evaluating the oil sample at different expiring date, we saw a decrease that was more um, uh, easy to, to understand. So the oil was getting um, less stable during aging. By plotting together these two sets of data, uh, we see this behavior. So this is the line related to the oil stability that with time from right to left, so you have to read this way. So with time, there is a decrease in oxidative stability. And about the tuna fish, with time, you have an increase of its quality. So it seems that the antioxidant property of the oil is gradually transferred to the tuna, increasing the tuna stabi oxidative stability. And this works until a point where then you don't, you cannot distinguish anymore the uh, difference between oil and tuna fish. So you see here the error bars, they, they touch each other. So it means there is not a statistically significant difference. So it, it means probably the oil went inside the, 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 the fish, the, the tissue, 
and uh, and then you cannot separate each other anymore and the um, all the um, antioxidant power of oil is transferred to the to the, um, the tissue Now I'll show you some example about uh, bakery products. Um, they are related to works that we performed in collaboration with uh, the food and drug department of our university, in particular with food technologies. Uh, they prepared some biscuits, starting from uh, different kinds of flours, so traditional flours, like rice flour and wheat flour, and then they enriched these um, flours with different substance, different um, extracts, in particular chestnut flour and chestnut peels it, in the way of uh, uh, use also the most, um, uh, um, the part of the, um, of the vegetables that are most rich of um, uh, polyphenols and antioxidant compounds. And if you have a look at these results, uh, we plotted the um, IP value at time zero and uh, at 90 days of storage, so after three months of storage, and we could see that the, the samples rich in, um, enriched with peels and chestnut flour had a um, higher stability respect to the traditional flours. Similarly, they also prepared some bread supplemented using green coffee parchment, which is the outer part of the coffee seeds, and it's very rich of polyphenols or um, antioxidant compounds. So, so they prepared these two kinds of bread, a control one and a supplemented one, and we perform a different assay, uh, the total phenolic content the antioxidant capacity and the oxidative stability with oxytest. It's interesting to see here that there is a difference in the way the three assays evaluated the, the two kind of breads. In fact, the total phenolic content did not show any difference. It's not statistically significant, the difference between control and supplemented bread. As for the antioxidant capacity, we see a very big difference. So we have six-fold uh, value, the six-fold higher than in the control, if you look at the numbers, about 10 and about uh, 65. And uh, Oxytes is in agreement with the antioxidant capacity because um, recorded a um, higher value for the supplemented bread respect to the control. But this is very interesting because it mm, it, 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 um, uh, it comes to our mind that there is a difference. So a difference. So we cannot always rely on one essay, but we have to distinguish what is going to tell us any kind of technique of method that we use. Uh, another point interesting in this research was that the presence of these antioxidant compounds from uh, the, the, the green coffee parchment gave also a, good, um, a great effect on the Maillard reaction progress. In fact, we measured by HPLC the hydroxymethylfurfural, which is a marker of Maillard reaction, and we saw that the supplemented bread had a half um, less than half amount of HMF respect to the control. So it means that these antioxidant substances have a very great impact on the, also on the technological process of uh, cooking. Let's move now to packaging materials. So I, I'm going to show in, in now uh, uh, a research that we performed with uh, an industry that is that produces uh, some food stored under oil. And this industry was interested in export their products abroad. And of course, when you need to send products in, uh, you need a packaging that ha is not too heavy, is not too fragile, so they wanted to move from glass to plastic material. So they wanted to evaluate the possibility to replace the glass containers with polypropylene container. 
uh, but the focus point of the research was to test the behavior of the oil inside the container after the autoclaving process, because for them it was mandatory to perform a um, sterilization step before selling their products. So we uh, performed our measure in uh, by oxy test uh, uh, before on the oil before the uh, pasteurization the, the sterilization in autoclave. Uh, this is the the first bar blue bar that you see on the graph, and then on after the uh, autoclaving in the different containers. So you see the the glass here and the polypropylene one and polypropylene two, so there were two different kind of materials, similar, but with different, um, the, the, the external part was a bit different. Uh, as you see, of course, the oil stored in glass showed the, the highest IP value. Uh, so it, it has a very uh, good and a better stability, stabilization after the, the sterilization process. Uh, but between the two, kind of um, plastic materials, the number two presented a, a, a less marked variation in the p-value. In particular, the um, variation was also depending on the time of the um, process, of the autoclaving process. The, these were 30 minutes of process, and this was the effect after 110 minutes. In, in any case, the number two showed best uh, results. Uh, another interesting point was to test and to follow the behavior of the oil after storage. So not only after the sterilization, but also after storage. And we use the climatic chamber to, to, to make a accelerated storage. So to, to see what could happen after a long storage of the um, container with the oil and the food inside. And uh, we saw a difference because the same material, if it was treated at 110 minutes, then it, it had a, a almost stable behavior. But if the treatment was only 30 minutes, it, there was uh, then afterwards during the accelerated um, storage, there was um, a, a higher decrease. So this confirmed that the oxidation process continues during storage and, uh, and the choice of the time of treatment needs to be evaluated in, um, with some more studies. Now I'll, um, I, I want to touch so the, the, the topic of sustainability uh, because there is a great interest in um, the last, last years about zero waste goal. So to all the um, circular economy project, uh, you know that the, um, the European community is very interested in finding a way to um, um, use by products to be reintroduced again into the productive cycle as a new raw materials to avoid waste. So we focused our attention on the agro-industrial byproducts that, that can be two kind of byproducts. One it can be constituted by vegetables that are normally discarded because they, their shape, uh, their um, dimension, their ripening uh, level are not uh, suitable with the standard for commercial um, distribution. So they are just discarded before being sold to commercial uh, uh, for commercial distribution. And the second type of uh, agroindustrial byproducts is uh, constituted by the parts or the, the, or the portion of the vegetables that are discarded during the industrial processing. For example, in this picture, I, I put a picture uh, um, uh, of um, artichoke um, outer parts that are normally discarded when the industry produce the, the artichoke under oil or, in, or um, in the um, 
uh, all, all products derived from artichoke. Uh, so normally uh, the, this industry, but not only about artichoke, but also onion and different kind of vegetables, they, they have lots and lots of um, uh, substance that had to be uh, discarded and uh, took away from the farm. And uh, they represent also a cost because they they don't know what to do what to do with the um, such uh, big amount of material uh, and uh, on, on the other side we have to consider that these substances are very rich of uh, still rich of active compounds that can be used for many in many applications so we try to perform extraction of the bioactive compounds contained in these materials. And we performed uh, first some uh, spectrophotogrammetrical assay to um, uh, measure the total phenolic content. And here you uh, can see some results about um, artichoke, onion, uh, grape seed. So you see that the, there are um, different amounts of um, phenolic compounds. And then with the same extract, we enriched a vegetable oil that uh, we, we chose as a model to test the activity of the ex extract. So we add a little portion of this extract to the oil and measured if there was a gain in uh, um, oxidative stability. And as you can see, asparagus, artichoke, onion, grapeseed, all of them gave a uh, um, higher stability to the oil. So it means they possess uh, good compounds that can be useful. Uh, we also plot the induction period versus the, the um, TPC, so the, the total phenolic content amount, and we saw a good correlation. So in, in this case, the activity could be really ascribed to the presence of the phenolic compounds. The extract could be used in, for many applications. In particular, we focused our attention on packaging production and we uh, co constructed some active packaging. In particular, they are edible films that can replace the plastic films. And they are made with onion, asparagus, chili peppers, artichoke, and so on. So they can even transfer to a food some aromatic uh, features and, uh, and be active and protect the food from uh, spoilage because they, they, are, they act as antioxidant. But there are also some many fields of application for this kind of extract. So not, not only packaging technology, but also nanoparticles production, nutraceutical, functional food, cosmetic, herbal medicine, and so on. So th these uh, uh, byproducts could be uh, really a source for many, many kind of products. And uh, now let's move to the last part, which is the comparison. So I, I already, uh, from time to time, uh, um, uh, raised your attention on this difference between the um, response that we get from oxytest and um, response that we get from other techniques, other assay that we usually perform to test the oxidative stability, antioxidant power, and so on. So I, I, I left this example uh, in the end uh, just to show the different behavior of oxytest and other techniques. Uh, this example is related uh, to another bakery product, in particular it, it, it's a biscuit uh, made also uh, from our colleagues of, of food and drug department. They prepare these, bis these biscuits inserting an extract from uh, olive leaves. But they added the extract to the dough of biscuits as a free extract. And then they prepared some other samples, adding the olive uh, leaf extract encapsulated inside some uh, alginate pectin capsules. So it was in this way, this uh, extract was protected from oxidation, for example, during the cooking of the biscuits. 
because in many cases, if you add an antioxidant to a product and then you perform a, a thermal treatment to the to this food, then you can go and you, you just destroy the antioxidant substance during cooking. So they try to protect the extract and see if there was a, a different effect. And we measured by oxidized the uh, induction, induction period, and we saw uh, uh, um, the, 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 in the first uh, blue bar the behavior of the control biscuit, so without any extract, any addition. In green, we see the biscuit reached with a free extract, so without protection. And with the, in the orange bar, you see the biscuit reached with the encapsulated extract. So as you can see, there is a difference between the three of them. So the free extract uh, exert an uh, activity, uh, so it, it was more stable than the control, but the one with the uh, oil, the extract protected in the capsule was even more active. So it means this protection was really working and maybe the release of the antioxidant was um, happening gradually in time so the effect could be exerted for a long, longer time but the interesting point is that we performed on the same sample also the DPPH assay and the total phenol content assay and in both cases we couldn't see any difference between the um, free extract addition and the encapsulated addition. You see there is no statistical difference between them. Only the oxy test could measure, could um, see that there was, could feel the difference. So it means that other say are able to measure the amount of substance, of active substance contained in the product but they cannot test the real activity or maybe not always. So they, they work, of course, in a different way. Uh, there is not something right and something wrong, of course. It's uh, just a different way to see things. But uh, this, um, from here, we, we, uh, we, we go just to this uh, summary I, I left at the end for the strength point of oxytest. To, to think about three many important points. Uh, so apart from the uh, one standpoint, that is that oxygen is very easy to use and is automatic. So th this is of course uh, something that you already know, but I wanted to point your attention on these three other points. The first one is that when we use oxy tests, uh, we performed our measures on the whole products not on an extract from the product. And this is important because when we perform an extract, we take out from the products a limited category of compounds, not all the, maybe not all the active compounds. So we test only what we take out from the food, but maybe we leave in, in the food, in the matrix, some other substance that can be useful to test. So we limit our test on a category of compound, not to all. Another point is that with oxy test, we evaluated all active compounds and not only what is able to react with a specific reagent. This because when we use an assay as DPPH or TPC, we use a reagent, a substance that can react but uh, maybe we extracted many compounds, but not all of them are able to react with the reagent. So um, if the reaction doesn't happen, doesn't occur, then we do don't taste the, the effect, okay? So we access, we are sure that everything is inside the food can uh, give its contribution. And this uh, uh, help to understand also the third, the final point, so the, the possibility to evaluate potential synergy. We know that in a food product, we have many compounds and we can have 
many antioxidants, but also some pro-oxidant. And the antioxidants, when they are together in the same matrix, they can act also in a synergic way. You know that sometimes you put two, some, two antioxidant and then you have an effect that is more than the sum of the two compounds together, is, is, is called the synergy effect. Um, we, with a normal test, if you measure the amount of active compounds, you don't, don't really test the activity, but only the amount. So you see that you have many polyph polyphenolic compounds, but you don't feel the real effect they have on the food. That's why oxidants can be considered the way to measure a real and a complete oxidative stability. So th th this is the point, the most important point that I, I wanted to, to, to show you in this uh, uh, presentation. Okay, so thank you for, for your attention. I, I leave now the um, microphone to the, the last part of, of the live demo in, in the lab. So, uh... Hi everybody, my name is uh, Matteo Bassani and I am a member of the analytical department since uh, April 2019. Today I'm going to show you how to start an analysis with the OxyTest. OxyTest is able to analyze solid samples, semi-solid samples or liquid samples. Usually when you analyze the sample, solid samples need to be grinded and liquid samples needs to be taken under steering condition. In this, for our today demonstration, we are going to analyze a solid sample that is hot meal. The OxyTest is connected to a PC and it works with the OxySoft software. The OxySoft permits to start the analysis and monitor them during the time. With the OxyTest, you can manage up to four instruments in order to perform a parallel testing in order to increase your lab productivity. On the main window of the OxySoft, you can find on the right side the operation condition, including the temperature of the oxidation chambers and the pressure of the two chambers, chamber A and chamber B. On the left side, you can you have uh, the visualization of the database with all the analysis that you have already done and the analysis that you have to do. To start analysis, uh, you have to fill only five information. The first information is the sample name. In our case, we type uh, hot meal. The second information is the sample weight. How can you choose uh, the correct amount of sample to analyze? In the analytics menu, methods, we have some guidelines that you can follow to uh, perform an analysis. Before starting analysis, uh, to select the correct sample weight, you have to know the total fat content of your sample, and in particular, the unsaturated fatty acids. So if you are, for making an example, if you are analyzing pasta that uh, has a very low fat content, you have to analyze from 30 to 45 grams of sample divided on three sample holders weighing, weighing uh, from, from 10 to 15 grams for each sample holder. On the contrary, if you are analyzing olive oil that has a very high amount of fat, you uh, need to analyze only uh, just five to 10 grams of sample on one sample holder. In this case, you have to place two spacers on the bottom of the chamber and place the sample holder with the olive oil on the top of the two chambers. The spacers are meant to have the uh, same oxygen volume inside the chamber. So for our um, uh, demonstration, we are going to analyze 30 grams of sample divided on three sample holders. So we type 30. The next uh, information that we need to insert, uh, to type is the test type. So in the test type field, we select sample. After this, we select the oxy test. In this case, oxy number one with the, its uh, serial number and the uh, chamber in the reactor field. 
chamber A. After this, with the right key of the mouse, press copy. And then again, with the right key, press add. Okay, a new line will appear and you have to type again the sample weight, 30 grams, and select the reactor B in order to analyze, to perform an analysis on both the two chambers. Okay, now you can place the sample orders with the sample inside the chamber. Place the O-ring into its, uh, its dedicated space. We, rec we recommend to clean the O-ring with a paper towel and to apply a thin layer of fresh high temperature silicone grease on the O-ring, this in order to extend the life of, this, uh, of the O-ring. After this step, place the titanium cover on the chamber and secure it with the screws. After this step, place the insulating foam panel on the, on the top of the two chambers. Before starting, the, after this step, uh, when you close the chambers, leave the knobs in the open position. On the Oxysoft, select the line with the right key of the mouse and press Set Start. After that, press Work Oxytest number one. For this analysis, the set parameters of uh, temperature and pressure are 90 degrees and six bar. So once you press Work, you have to wait that uh, the Oxytest reaches the uh, set point, uh, the temperature set point. You can check it on the right side of the main window. After, uh, once the temperature reached the set point, press start. After 10 minutes, after 10 minutes, the, a message will appear on the, a message will appear on the axis of them to remember to close the discharge box before, before pressurizing. So, on the, um, the oxytest, to rotate the knobs of uh, 90 degrees. Now the analysis has started and you can monitor it and you can monitor the oxidation graph real time. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much. And now I'd like to go to the questions part of our webinar. Um, we'll start here with the first question. What are the operational limits, both for temperature and pressure of the instrument? Um, that's a really good question. So I know I briefly mentioned it before, but for our temperature aspect, you can go up to 120 degrees Celsius. And for our pressure, you can go up to eight bars of pressure. Now, why those maximums? Um, due to actual incineration of the sample, anything higher than that would not be applicable and would ruin the sample rather than get an oxidative result. So that's the reason why we have those operational limits. Um, I see I have a lot of questions here, so I'll try to, uh, to get through as many as I uh, as possibly can um, with the time we're allotted. Does VELP conduct training on how to use and operate the equipment? And how is that structured? So yes, as I was mentioning during our service slide, we have the ability to be on site to actually both install the instrument and do some training as well. So any operators and managers that want to use the equipment are able to do so in a timely fashion. 
Now, how does VELP conduct training on how to use and operate the equipment? Oh, we just got that one answered. Um, let me see here. Oh, so can we use the OxyTest to test tablet pharmaceuticals? Um, the short answer is yes, right? With that, those fat-coated drugs, you're able to actually get a result for those samples, and it's applicable in pharmaceuticals as well as food and agriculture, which has been most of this webinar. Um, so I think that's about all the time we have. Um, I know we still have a few questions I wasn't able to answer, but um, you'll get a follow-up after this webinar from our analytical department for some of those specifics about um, Dr. Antonella Cavazza's study, as well as some of those technical aspects you're wondering about. I want to thank you all for joining us again, and I uh, hope to uh, be in touch soon. Thank you.